Now can I request uh, Professor Vani Kant Barwa to ad to give the keynote address before uh, sir one minute sir sir before he delivers uh, this keynote address let me brief about uh, Professor Vani Kant Barwa. Professor Vani Kant Barwa is a professor of applied economics at the University of Ulster and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. He was born in India and went to England in 1973 as a postgraduate student to the University of Southampton. After taking his PhD from Southampton in 1977, he joined, he joined the Department of Applied Economics at the University of Cambridge. As a research officer, he was a concurrently fellow of Queen's College, Cambridge. In 1987, he was appointed to the Chair in Applied Economics at the University of Ulster. Professor Barwa is the pa uh, past president of the European Public Choice Society and of the Irish Economic Association and is honorary professor of economics at the University of Queensland. His work has been mainly in the areas of unemployment, inequality, poverty, and development. Now, may I request you to give the keynote address, sir. Thank you, sir. So, let me just make sure that everyone can under hear me. I was going to say understand, but uh, let's stick Sorry, to here. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rao, uh, Registrar, Professor Acharya, Professor Kancha. It's uh, an honor and a privilege for me to be here to give you the keynote address. You know, it's a well-known fact at universities that the presence of a registrar immediately transforms an occasion from important to very important. So I hope I do justice to the occasion, sir, and thank you very much for being here. So I want to talk today about social sciences and in terms of what we are trying to do and also how we should go about doing so. So I'm going to structure my talk around these two themes, what we should do and uh, how we should go about doing what we should do. And I'm going to start by harking back to a great philosopher, Descartes, who is universally regarded as the father of modern philosophy. And Descartes' big theme was encapsulated in a single sentence, which is, I think, and therefore I am. Okay. Cogito ergo sum. And the meaning of this was that the essence of human beings was the mind. And this is what defines us as human beings. And anything that we do, or any conclusions that we come to, or any knowledge that we discover, has to be based on reason. We must have engage our mind, and only our mind, in arriving at knowledge. And Descartes' principle played a very major role in the natural sciences. And natural sciences from Descartes' time was based on evidence, experiment, argument, but no emotion, only reason. That was the essence of Descartes. But unfortunately, there is another form of reasoning which is quite opposed to Descartes. And this form of reasoning goes something like this. It goes, I feel it in my heart. I feel it in my heart and therefore it must be true. And this is the kind of reasoning that psychologists and psychiatrists call emotional reasoning. We don't reason with our head, but we reason with our heart. And in emotional reasoning, what we do is we have certain feelings which we don't fully understand, but we take these feelings and regard them as a representation of reality, of the way the world works. And most psychologists recognize that if you think along these lines, if you use emotional reasoning, then you're well on your way to mental illness. So for example, if you're paranoid, you feel, you feel that people are conspiring against you, and therefore you draw the conclusion that the world is full of conspiracies. If you are depressed and sad, you draw the conclusion that the world is a sad and dismal place. 
If you are anxious and worried, you draw the conclusion that the world is dangerous and full of um, unknown problems and dangers. And so this kind of emotional reasoning therefore leads to various forms of mental illness and psychologists and psychiatrists know how to deal with this through appropriate uh, therapy. Unfortunately, the kind of emotional reasoning which psychologists recognize as dangerous is very common in the social sciences. And very often in the social sciences, we draw conclusions about the way the world works based upon feelings which we do not fully understand and for which really there is sometimes very little evidence. So let me take three examples of this kind of emotional reasoning as it occurs in society. But before that, let me say that this kind of emotional reasoning leads to a kind of social pathology. It leads to a kind of social illness which is the equivalent of mental illness with individuals. It leads to a kind of social illness. And it is based upon the fact that when we think about social issues, we confuse emotion with reason. We confuse our feelings with the way the world works. The way the world works is an objective phenomenon. Our feelings are entirely subjective, but we are unable to distinguish between the two. So let me take three examples of this. One is immigration. So in the recent British election, immigration was a big issue. Most people who were going to vote in this election felt they were against immigration. They didn't know why they were against immigration, but they were against immigration. There was one woman who was interviewed on television who was herself the daughter of immigrants who objected to immigration because she didn't like Lithuanian being sp spoken on English streets. It didn't give a nice atmosphere to English streets. So she didn't like immigrants. So many people had all sorts of reasons for not liking immigrants and immigration based purely on subjective feelings. But from this, they drew the conclusion that immigration was a bad thing. So they translated their individual feelings about immigration to some kind of a state of the world that immigration was bad. And one of the remarkable things about this was that social scientists played a very small role or hardly any role in providing evidence for or against these feelings. And what was even sadder was that politicians accepted this anti-immigrant feeling. Well, if people don't like immigration, we have to cater to their tastes. But rather than lead, politicians decided to follow um, British tastes in disliking immigration. So this is an example of um, emotional reasoning where we use our prejudices and we translate our prejudices and we use them to arrive at some conclusions about the way the world works. And the second example that I want to take to you is the example of malnutrition. We know that in India, children are severely malnourished. And in fact, if you compare India with sub-Saharan Africa, you will find that the rates of malnourishment, undernourishment, stunting, underweight children is higher than that in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is a puzzle because India generally is a more affluent country than many countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So why should it be that in a richer country, we have higher rates of malnutrition? Now, one example, um, one uh, explanation that I put to you and which I'll develop uh, in my book when I speak about it day after tomorrow, is that malnutrition has very little to do with food or the availability of food, but it has a lot to do with the capacity to absorb food. So when Amartya Sen was writing about famines, he asked this question, why do famines occur? And the usual answer to that 
was food availability. Famines occur because there's no food. And his proposition was, no. Famines occur not because there is no food, but famines occur because people can't afford to buy food. For whatever reason, they can't afford to buy food. So there's a lot of food. there was a lot of food in the Bengal famine in the market, but because people suddenly lost their crops or, or suddenly lost their livelihood, they were unable to buy food, and that caused the famine. And I argue that with, mal with malnourishment, there's a similar situation. Most people who think of malnourishment think in terms of give children more food and that'll solve the problem. No, that won't solve the problem. The problem is that children in India suffer from gastroenteritis diseases. And because of that, even if you give them food, they are unable to absorb these nutrients. And because they are unable to absorb these nutrients, they remain malnourished, even in families which are rich and which can afford a good diet for their children. They can afford a good diet, but their children cannot absorb the good diet. And the reason they cannot absorb a good diet is because of poor sanitation. And poor sanitation is linked to a lack of lavatories. This means that men and women go out into the fields. It is linked to a lack of domestic hygiene. People do not wash their hands. And therefore, there's a ready mechanism for fecal matter carrying diarrhea pathogens to transfer themselves from adults, especially women who feed children with their hands, to children. Children stay in a state of chronic dysentery. And because they stay in a state of chronic dysentery, you can give them all the food in the world, but they can't absorb this food, and they remain malnourished. So what's the lesson from this? The lesson from this is this is also kind of social pathology. But this pathology doesn't arise from prejudice or discrimination. It arises from a failure to connect the dots. And this, by this I mean that people who see malnutrition remain in this silo or remain in this bunker of malnutrition and food. They don't think outside the box. And if you need to think outside the box, or you should think outside the box, and you should connect the dots between malnutrition, diarrhea, lack of sanitation, and then back to diarrhea and back to malnutrition. So this is another kind of a failure of social science to think and therefore to be, and this failure arises from a failure to connect the dots. Now the third example that I'm going to give you is from this question, what makes people succeed in life? Why do some people succeed in life? And why do people, by um, the contraposition, why do people fail in life? Now, if you ask people what makes for success, then most people will focus on individual qualities. They will say, if you are hardworking, if you are intelligent, if you persevere, these are the qualities that make for success. And what's the corollary of that? If you believe this, what's the corollary of that? The corollary of that is that if you see somebody who is a failure, who has not succeeded, then you draw the conclusion that this person has not succeeded because he's not a hard worker, he or she is not a hard worker, he or she is not intelligent, or he or she doesn't have perseverance. So if you see a person who is a failure, you draw malign conclusions about that person's ability in terms of either work, intelligence, or perseverance. And when you see a group failing, then you have what is called statistical discrimination. When members of that group come up for employment, the employer refuses to employ people from that particular group because he feels that as a group, on average, they are failures. And because they are failures, they couldn't be very hardworking, they couldn't be very intelligent, and they couldn't have much perseverance. 
Now, this is a form, I think, of social pathology. Because recently there was a big study on what makes people succeed. And what makes people succeed has very little to do with the individual, but it has very much to do with the family and particularly with parents. So we hear very much of a glass ceiling. A glass ceiling is when you come from certain disadvantaged groups, women, uh, ethnic groups, and you rise up to a certain point, but then your he head hits a ceiling and you can't rise any further and when you see the people who are promoted, they are not from your group. Women see men being promoted and occupying high positions. Uh, people from minority groups seeing, see people from majority groups rise and occupy hard, uh, high positions. That's the glass ceiling. But there's also a glass floor. And the glass floor is that if you don't have much ability, you don't, you're not very intelligent, et cetera, et cetera, but you come from a good family, a rich family, you will not be allowed to fall below a certain level. And the reason you won't be allowed to fall below a certain level is because your parents will invest heavily in you as a person. And by investing heavily in your person, they will disguise the fact that you don't have ability, they will disguise the fact that you don't have intelligence, and they will disguise the fact that you're quite lazy, and they prevent you from falling, and that leads to a glass floor. So what's the implication of this? The implication of this is that when we see somebody who's successful, we should not automatically assume that that person is bright, intelligent, and success, uh, bright, intelligent, and hardworking. Rather, it is more reasonable to assume that that person comes from, is lucky, because he comes from a well-off family who have invested in him. And similarly, when we see a person who is not um, successful, we should not conclude that that person does not have the qualities for success in terms of hard work and intelligence. Rather, we should come to the conclusion that that person has not had the opportunity to succeed because of ill luck of being born into the wrong family. So it's very important in social sciences to draw a distinction between equality of outcome and equality of opportunity. Very often we have a mindless form of equality. We have tests for entering institutions of learning. We have tests for entering the administrative services. And we say that because of equality of outcome, only the top 20% should get in. Only the top 10% should get in. But what we ignore the fact is that by insisting on equality of outcome, we ignore the inequality of opportunity which led to that particular outcome. So you might have a very bright child who went to not a very good school who scores less than a person who had a lot of coaching and a lot of training who scores more than him in the exam. But in terms of potential, in terms of the contribution to society, the first child who did not have the resources will probably make a much bigger contribution than the child which passed the exam with a lot of help. And we have to recognize this. And in recognizing this, we have to recognize that when you have inequality of outcome, some people do well and some people do not, we should not accept these test scores at face value, but we should also look at the inequality of opportunity which gave rise to these tests, and we should adjust these test scores in order to take account of this inequality of opportunity. And I think a failure to do this is a social pathology. And it is a very common thing that, you know, my ch child scored 90%, the other person's child scored only 80%, but that person got in and my child didn't get in. This is an injustice. But the injustice is not just that injustice. The injustice is with why did the child get 80% and your child got 90% and the inequality of opportunity that might have under, uh, underpinned these test scores. So that's another point I want to make. And these points are aggravated in the context of social exclusion. That is, people are systematically excluded 
from certain spheres of life. And by being excluded from certain spheres of life, they simply do not have the opportunities that are available to other people. And they might be excluded from education, they might be excluded from economic resources, they might be excluded from social interaction, but all these exclusions impoverish their lives, and by impoverishing their lives, they reduce their welfare. And the big question for social scientists is, what should we do about social exclusion? Now, my view is that there are two things we can do about social exclusion. We can emphasize outcomes and or we can emphasize process. And in my view, India's big failure is that it emphasizes outcomes and ignores processes. So in, um, uh, out emphasizing outcomes basically says, well, socially excluded constitute 10, 20% of our society, let us say, hypothetically. And so let's reserve 20% of jobs, 20% of places in high, ed high educational institutions for, th for these people. And so we have an outcome. We have an outcome in which, in government jobs, in government education institutions, 20% of people who are in these institutions come from a deprived background. But once we do that, we sort of rub our hands and like George Bush, we say, mission accomplished, nothing more to be done. But we don't ask about process. What happens to these people when they enter these institutions? What happens to these people when they get government jobs? Do they pass their exams if they are the IIT? Do people from scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, how well do they do? What kind of care do they receive? people in government jobs, do they rise in the civil service or simply do they join at a particular level and stay at that level while other people rise? So in my view, when we look at social exclusion and what to do about social exclusion, we shouldn't just look at mechanistic solutions. A mechanistic solution is 20% of the population is socially excluded, therefore let's reserve 20% of all jobs, places in higher education institutions, for these people, and that's the end of the matter. But when we think that's the end of the matter, the answer is no, that's really the beginning of the matter. The beginning of the matter is then we need to play, put into place processes which will ensure that when these people are included in society, they are truly included and become part of the fabric of society rather than simply staying on the edges and looking in. So that's my take on social exclusion. So with all this, the conclusion that I come to is a big role of social sciences is to cure social pathologies in the same way that psychiatrists and psychologists address mental illnesses. In a similar way, society suffers from social illnesses and social pathologies because it is unable to distinguish between the heart and the brain. It is unable to reason with the head, and therefore when it reasons, it reasons with the heart. It <coughs> takes its prejudices, it takes its negative feelings, and it transfers these to the state of the world. And we need to provide the kind of therapy, the kind of evidence, the kind of conviction to society to start thinking with its head rather than with its heart. And why is it important to do so? Well, it's important to do so for a number of reasons. First of all, the world has become extremely interdependent. It's very difficult to say that something is a purely economic issue or a social issue. Economic issues have social consequences, and social issues have economic consequences. And for this reason, we can no longer see ourselves as subject specialists operating within a subject box. As an economist, I need to have some awareness of society. And as a sociologist or a political scientist, others have to have a certain awareness of economics. So there has to be a much greater emphasis on 
multidisciplinary <coughs> and interdisciplinary research. That is a very important aspect. The second aspect is that as social scientists, we need to do good research. And good research, if you're a quantitative person like me, you need good data. And if you're a qualitative person, you need good narratives, good historical accounts, good focus groups, good interview questions. But whatever you do, you need to do good research. I think the third thing that you need to do is you need to do imaginative research. In other words, it is your research agenda which should dictate the data rather than the data dictating your research agenda. And too often, research can be very unimaginative. And a very good example of this is research on poverty in India. We are hung up on numbers. Should it be the Tendulkar line? Should it be somebody else's line? Should we correct for this? Should we correct for that? Has poverty fallen by two percentage points or gone up by two percentage points? That is important, but I think that misses the point. The point is we need to have a view of what is poverty? How does poverty impact on people's lives? How does it stunt their chances? Have people's chances gone up? How is poverty linked to social exclusion, discrimination, etc.? So these are a much broader set of questions and a much more interesting set of questions which we fail to ask very often because we are taught to think in very mechanistic lines along, if you like, an assembly line approach towards doing research. So the third thing we need to do is imaginative research. I think the fourth thing we should need to do is we need to reconcile different aspects of a problem. What do I mean by this? I mean, say to take the debate between inequality and growth. Many people are confused by this. Should we have growth, but what will happen to inequality? Or should we succeed, should we try and reduce inequality, but what will happen to growth? And I think, as social scientists, we need to remove this confusion. But in order to remove this conclusion, we ourselves should have a nuanced and a subtle view of what constitutes social science. We need to distinguish between development and growth. That's a very important distinction we need to appreciate. We need to appreciate that fairness, equality of treatment, opportunity, particularly in paternalistic societies, like India, gender opportunities, opportunities for different groups, these are as important a part of the development process as raising incomes. And in short, we need to see that raising incomes, which is very much the mantra today of uh, the, uh, the new planning commission or the, in this new form, that raising incomes is a necessary condition for human welfare, but it's not a sufficient condition. And we need to set out the full set of conditions, both necessary and sufficient, which are needed for a more harmonious and a more prosperous society. Lastly, we may do all the research in the world, but nobody may listen to us. So doing research is a necessary condition for changing policy, but it is not a sufficient condition. The very fact that you have done research does not mean that people will read what you have done, does not mean that people will understand what you have done, and lastly, it does not mean that in formulating policy, they will take on board the conclusions that you have come to. So for that, we have to do something more. We need to dis disseminate our research. And to disseminate our research, it's not just enough to do research, but it is very important to engage with people, engage with policymakers, engage with the media, and engage with the public at large so that we can win their confidence, both in terms of people who make policy and also people who are at the receiving end of policy. So we command their respect and their goodwill. So what I would urge social scientists to do is 
come out of their ivory tower, switch off their computer sometimes, and go and talk to people and try and convince them that what they have come to, conclusions they have come to in their research, are worth implementing in terms of policy. But finally, coming back to Descartes, what we need to do is to extend Descartes' statement, which was couched in the singular, into the plural. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. That is a statement of the individual. But as a collective, we very often fail to do that. And that is what I feel is the mission of social scientists. We must take Descartes' statement and say that we, as a society, as a social order, as an economy, as a polity, we think, we engage our mind, and therefore, we as a society, economy, polity, social order, therefore, we are, therefore, we exist. Therefore, we exist as a, as a social entity because we have engaged our minds as a social entity. So, Dr. Rao, with that thought, I will leave my keynote to rest. Thanks.